Hello and welcome to Hair in the Hawthorne. My name's Kate Ray and I am your host. I've also got with me my co-host, the lovely Neil Rushton. Um, he's going to be helping us along this evening with one interview that I am particularly excited about uh, this week. It is a recurring guest. Uh, Thomas came on the show in the first six months of putting things together um, and we had a really really good chat about um, all kinds of things for team but particularly about ghost hunting de demonics ouija board work uh, and the fairies as well so where this is going to go this evening um i don't know and i'm really excited to see where that goes so welcome thomas um i'm going to introduce you uh, first and foremost as an author and prolific podcaster but so much more to you than that. I mean, your breadth of knowledge and um, uh, a depth of knowledge is is just incredible about a plethora of subjects. So, thank you so long, uh, so much for for coming along and joining us this evening. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for asking me, Kate and Neil. I'm absolutely excited about this. To be honest, I was buzzing the last few days. Looking forward to it. Oh, bless you. That's so nice. That is so nice to hear. We're going to start off with a bit of a hot topic. Um, I'm just going to open it up. We have been chatting about this uh, online before we started recording, and it's something that's incredibly topical right now, and that's the UFO sightings that have taken place over America. And there has been um, lots of, of talk about what that may, may be. And I'm I'm interested Thomas to kind of get your perspective on what's been going off there well it's it's a really tricky one because there's so many it's like you know that classic thing an enigma wrapped up inside a mystery held inside a, a lie or whatever and so it's a tricky one I really don't know my my uh, look my just to lay it on the line these mm -hmm. phenomena are real okay these this this Fortean paranormal aspect to it of these lights in the sky is, is a very real thing. And it's more closely linked to fairy folklore and things like the jinn and stuff like that, interdimensionalism, than we're generally told about. At the same time, too, they have a tremendous propaganda. The Americans rec recognized from very early on that it also has an enormous propaganda thing in the cultivation of things like cults, in the cultivation and the belief that there's a certain power that they have over their enemies and so on like this. And I think that's what's going on right now. And, you know, this is just a wild guess now, mm -hmm. but those balloons, you know, they're, they're, they're probably, they're, I'm so almost certain they are balloons, except for one weird hexagonal thing. Now, for some reason, these things are also seem to have a strong link with psychic energy. And this could be part of the PSYOP as well. And so they launched a few big weather balloons. They may, they, they may have even made that spiral in the sky over, over uh, Hawaii just to drum the whole thing up. And it's the Jungian thing, you know, and people are afraid they will, they will transform, transfer into phantoms in the sky. So I think they're like literally trying to... It's like after 70 years, the US military finally understands what these things are and that there's some kind of psychic phenomena or in, 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 in some way. And they're probably trying to start a belief. Now, as I said with Sarah last night, and hopefully this video will be up on my Odyssey channel as well, again, it's been taken down, is that uh, these things have a tremendous propaganda value. But we're, the United States, the Biden administration, is really in an awful lot of trouble as are the globalists right now. I mean, a lot of things that they wanted haven't happened for them. They did the, the things like the Needlecraft Pass that that was supposed to be forever. That that's gone. It's you know, we should say that the, the situation in Eastern Europe is not going the way they want it to go. And there's other things too. The climate cult hasn't really hasn't captured the imagination of the average person. And then you have other issues too with. Uh, a certain pipeline that was bombed and now that's not looking like a Reichstag fire kind of thing and wasn't what they said it was. So there was always going to be the last the last dice on the table for their for their plans was always going to be a, this this thing I always thought. And it's and lots of other people have said this over the years as well, but I always thought it was very plausible. But all they lack was two things, the technology and the training of society. And they've beautifully trained society in the last 
two and a half years since the since the beginning of that event that began in April 2020. And they've created a culture of fear in the population, you know, sort of like a, a genuine sense of danger around every corner. Now, they could unleash this false alien thing now, but even if they did it now, even with all their ducks in a row, it's an incredibly risky gamble. And they know it. And they've got their finger on the trigger. But it's like that thing, the finger on the trigger, but still don't have the guts to pull it just yet. And that's why I said to Sarah, I said, we should be getting everyone we can to start talking about this because they most likely won't do it if everyone's talking about it. And it seems to be going in that direction. It seems to be going that way. And uh, and then they'll just say, I'll oh, forget about it. And then they'll leave us alone or something. But that's my take on it. But that doesn't distract from the fact that I, there's a real phenomena there, which I'm absolutely convinced is not, not in any way connected to nuts and bolts visiting spacemen from other planets. In fact, if you look at if you look at the that's the least option that would be in reality. It's only by sort of like reinfor cultural reinforcement through sci-fi and movies and TV that has people seeing lights in the sky and the next thing they're thinking spacemen. Uh, this, that extrapolation is purely culturally, in, culturally cultivated. Mm. And so yeah, that, no, that, that's how it stands for me right now. That, yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant. I, I go along with that. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, it, it, we can perhaps come back on to you know the correlation between UFOs, whatever you want to call them, and fairy folklore uh, uh, later la later on. That that you know if we have time, that would be very useful to to, to talk about that. The, but but just before we get off of this subject, it, it is interesting, isn't it? How the sort of people who have been uh, um, ridiculing people who have been into ufos for for many years you know oh it's a conspiracy theories you're a nutcase this is a load of nonsense suddenly because they've been given permission by the government the military uh by official sources suddenly they seem to be coming round and oh well it's on cnn it's on the bbc it, 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 it this this must be a real phenomenon did you, did you find that interesting in a very smug almost condescending way <laughs> i found that there's a I, I, they, were, they get the psychic weather i look around a lot of normie boards and one of them here in Ireland is called boards.ie which is an, an enormous one it's mostly civil servants and sort of like middle class people who are you know <laughs> paid to doss off all day and they, they spend all time <laughs> talking about how clever they are and how left wing they are and how liberal they are and progressive they are on the internet and uh, so someone started a thread about a year ago saying so what's the story with UFOs and they're all like well you know it's, it's it's been, it's, been, it's been quantified now by the US military and they have the camera. And I was like, you twats, five months ago, if anyone was to bring this stuff up, you'd be posting pictures of cats with tinfoil hats on their head. And now, because this is this, the authorities have given you permission to accept it, it now becomes a, a, a legitimate topic of discussion. And, it, and, and, and I would jump in now and again, but what do you think it really is? Oh, they're just lights in the sky. They're just lights in the sky. And I says, aside from aliens, do you think it could be some kind of, a, a, you know, some kind of other life form, like a type of consciousness? And then the uh, tinfoil hats would come out. So they'd be waiting for the government to tell them it's something like that next. And the more I showed them things like, I like they were actually calling Carl Jung a kook. And they were calling, you know, it, it was like, and I was talking... They were very kind of annoyed that I knew a lot about the subject. I was bringing up orders like Jacques Vallée and stuff like this and and all this kind of stuff. And it was almost like, no, you must only accept that these are strange lights that are possibly alien spaceships. And that's it. But in a very, a very arrogant, the same kind of mentality they had regarding the needlecraft and the, the restrictions and the faith nappies and all that. Oh, well, you know, it's only kooks don't believe, you know. And it's like you're completely caught up in magical thinking that has been officially given to you, and you think you're some kind of intellectual now. Mm. Have, you guys, have you guys found that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, fascinates me about this, I haven't been following it 
um, as much as I should. Um, I, I just I hear things like this and, and it's kind of it was it was always on the conspiracy bingo card, wasn't it, that the alien thing would would come into play at some some stage. But I hear things like this and in my head I have that that goes off. Um, and what, but one of the things that fascinates me about it is up until this point, um, UFO, intraterrestrials, extraterrestrials, um, there has been millions of encounters and, and incredible uh, documentation about these encounters. And the government have been very, very slow to respond, if at all. And then all of a sudden, with what's going off over America, and that there has been countless sightings, you know, over over the the years. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's it's you know the, these encounters are being talked about on governmental levels and quite openly as well discussed to the people and the possibilities that this could be alien and for me that's a huge huge red flag about why they're doing it and what what they're doing it for it's incredible really and it makes me think about the whole ufo ufology scene you have things like ancient aliens saying that Stonehenge and New Grange and the pyramids are all built by spacemen. And it's a total degradation of human ancient history. And you have other things like they had a very ready-made audience already in these conferences. I, like, I, I was saying to Sarah last night, I knew a chap, he's dead now, but he worked on the, he used to sell 40 in books at all the events around UK and Ireland and Europe. And he mostly was interested in cryptids, cryptids and things like that. But he, he so he went, but he went to all the UFO events and saw all the talks. And he said he had went to UFO events in 1986, the first one, and then he went to another one. The last one was in 2006. And he says in that 20 years, the exact same exact topics were covered in every single talk with no change. Roswell, Rendlesham Forest, all and. And, and he said, you'd have someone putting a slide up on a screen. And he says, this is a place called Roswell. Now, they'd heard the story 100,000 times. But they sat there like they were hearing it for the first time ever. And he said, after what, a few years, he realized these people are going to church. They don't want to hear anything other than the classic MUFON ufology, the, but the classic stories repeated over and over again in the same way a religious service has the same things over and over again. It's purely church for them. And he said to me, these people are like an occult. And he said he witnessed the one or two things over the year where someone might have said, have you ever thought of fairies? Have you ever thought of the jinn? Have you ever thought of things like this? And they'd be literally attacked by the audience. Yeah. So that's a, that's that. They've got, they've got this ready-made. And these events, he said, some of them are enormous. They would rent arena, halls with like two or 3,000 people in them, in like the north of England and this kind of thing. He says, you wouldn't believe how massive it is. And he goes, and they're all, all they want to hear is the same things over and over again. And th th it's always to do with the, the aliens are going to come soon. They're going to tra transform life on this planet. And they're going to give us free energy. For some reason, free energy was always a big deal with these people. But he said, when he did the last one, it was like, he, he learned he, in the 20 years that him going to hundreds of their UFO, UFO conferences, he learned no more on the last one than he'd learned on the first one. And he was interested, you know, he wanted, he wanted to learn things. He was a fortian. Mm. Yeah, the, the, uh, I'd say, you know, it's a big clique, isn't it? And, and you get these cliques in any kind of special subject matter, definitely in folklore, in, uh, um, in, in psychedelic community. Um, you get these inner, inner cliques. But I think the UFO clique is the biggest of the lot because they've, they've, become ideologically captured by that nuts and bolts spacecraft coming down from other planets and everything else is outside of that reality tunnel and they they will just yeah. dis, dis, despite um you know this has been alternatives has been talked about for a long time by as you say Jacques Vallée um John Keel uh, Patrick Harper uh, you, you know these fantastic authors and researchers Rosemary um, Rosemary Allen Guiley yes and uh, but but they they're outside of it. They 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 aren't allowed into that. You know, even someone as famous as Jacques Vallée is not allowed inside of that 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 big clique, which continues to 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 this day. I'm sure I'm sure they're having orgasms about what's going on at the moment in in thinking that you know finally the aliens have arrived and shown themselves. Oh yeah, I mean I've been around some of these people, 
they're nice enough folks and everything. But they, you know, they said, I saw a black, I saw the black helicopters once, the strange black helicopters. And I said, well, funny enough, so did I. And, and they said, what do they look like? And I said, they were just, they look like just, just some kind of pastiche of a 1950s helicopter. And they moved with a, some of the bog up the road here. Uh, they moved without making a sound and they flew like gnats like this. And she said, oh, I saw them too. They're aliens. And I says, hold on a second. How do you know that? And she goes, and she's, what do you think they are? And I says, I think they're like part of the whole fairy thing. And she looked at me as like I, if I had just announced I was secretly a woman. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that, that's it. I'm sure that's the sort of natural response that, that you get. But can, can, excuse me, Kate, can, can, that's can, fine. I, yeah, can yeah. I can I move us on? Because you've been talking yeah. about co conferences and, um, you know, MUFON conferences and the sort of people who go to there. Now, a much more sensible um uh, better conference is obviously the mysterious earth conferences which um uh, which will which kate and i are, go, are going to take part in this year in september so um do, do, do you want to just talk about um you know yourself and neil mcdonald have organized these i can't, can't remember how many you've done but perhaps you could just tell us how this started what you've done and what what's going to be happening this year in september in blackpool well, it's it's uh, it's it's Neil's gig. I'm just kind of like a uh, sort of like the celebrity hanger on, I guess. That we're used. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind it because I love it, you know. But uh, if Neil contacted me at the beginning of the uh, the lockdowns, and he didn't really know who I was, he saw he didn't know I had a big audience or had all these subscribers and everything. I don't think. And he said, "I saw you did a, a video on like Carol Keel and Sligo." Uh, would you be interested in working on stuff? And I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's do something. So I went over to the uh, the Lake District and we hit it off. We went to see the, the, the megaliths up around, you know, around that part of the world. And uh, I fell in love with the place. I thought it was fantastic. And he said, I often do a conference where you do a talk at it. So that was like, that. I think that last year was the second one, third one I did. I can't remember. But uh, I think, yes, the third one, maybe. This year will be the third one, sorry. And... Uh, it was in a village hall in a nice place, a good, de decent sized venue in uh, near near Preston in the north of England. And the first year there was a decent crowd, but the second year, well, like the place was packed out. And last year there was like standing room only. It was all around the walls. And we released a film that we'd made on Atlantis, on our theories of Atlantis. And that was actually what we got involved in talking at the beginning. He just more casually said to me, how do you feel about Atlantis? And I says, yeah, I think there was such a place, and I think it was in this part of the world, isn't what's left of it. Uh, it might not have been called Atlantis by the people here and stuff like that, but there's, there's definitely anomalies that the further west you go in megaliths, the more the more advanced they seem to get. And that, that's totally in defiance of the, you know, the, the history. They're supposed to be the least, and they get older as well. Like the megaliths in Sligo here, some of the oldest in Europe, they should be some of the most recent. So they're not coming from the out, out of Babylon thing. So that's, we made a film, very proud of that film. And it's called Atlantis and Empire Lost and Found. And this year we're doing a film on the, on the Pendle Witches, which I, I which is uh, where we've written a book, we finished a book and it's at the kind of the, the final stages. And that that's also the, the script for the film. And, I, I became fascinated. Well, he grew up with it because he grew up in that part of the world. But I became fascinated with the Pendle Witches because, um, amazingly enough, we, all, we have almost no history of witch persecutions in Ireland. Uh, Catholic countries tended to be, you know, if you look, if you compare like the, the persecution of witches in Ireland compared to Scotland, it's day and night. There was horrific persecutions in Scotland, as bad as Germany, as bad as, really as bad. And England was, was, not, was pretty bad too. But Ireland, nothing, almost nothing. And the, the witch cases that stand out, they're famous only because they're so rare. There was it just didn't happen here. Uh, because I think it's it, like I think Catholic a lot of when you look when you look at the history of witch persecutions, a lot of it had to do with sectarianism. It was they were often, you know, I'm not I'm not taking sides here, but it was often uh, fundamentalist Protestants who were Lutherans or the whole King James thing. And they, they, they saw there was a handy link between Catholics and folk magic, and therefore as a handy way of dealing with Catholics in certain countries. And so that's where, that, like in Scandinavia, particularly, and parts of England and Scotland. So 
But it was more than that. It was more than that. And then when I really started to go to Pendle and started to explore these places, and I said to him, if, if, I'm, if we're doing a project on this, I want to do it from the point of view that no one's done it yet, that magic is actually real and it does work. And this isn't just an sectarian issue or a persecution of women or poor people, that they're magic. And we do, and that's, the, that's, the, that's where we're doing it. And he was down with that, yeah, right away, absolutely. So uh, that's what that will come from, that these people, yes, they were victims of a sectarian regime in England at the time. Yes, they, yes, they were Catholics. They were poor. They're from Lancaster, Lancashire, which was considered like no man's land at the time. Uh, there was also prejudice from the, the royal family because they were generally Scottish Presbyterians, didn't like Northern Catholics in England. And there's a lot, yeah, all that's true. All that's true. The witchcraft was real and it worked. And that's, that'll, that'll be the film. And there'll also be other people that like Greg Moffat, yourselves, and a few others. And it's a really fabulous conference because it's very laid back, easy going and prosaic. And it's not sensationalist. And it's not, uh, it has a, a very a great diversity of people. And it's in a beautiful location. It's in St. Anne's this year, which is just out of Blackpool, but literally on the beach. So it's beautiful up there. It's a beautiful town. So you'll really enjoy it up there. I mean, yeah, I'm, well, I'm certainly excited about it. And uh it's uh i feel like for me it's it's a massive honor uh to be to be asked to to go and uh the the topics have been so broad um from from what i've seen it's uh it's it's going to be brilliant it's going to be I, i'm excited to see everybody talk as much as anything else it's um yeah, uh, well, i said to neil i said the only topic you haven't really covered is fairies properly and then i told him about you and neil and then I said, like, well, I I discovered Neil actually in fourteen times. He was mentioned in an article, and then his blog Dead but Dreaming was in there, and that's how I got into Neil stuff. But I said, uh, and this dealt about you, Kate, that was on your show, and that's I said the only thing you haven't done is fairies. Now it ties in perfectly with other stuff as well, mm. because the kind of the world of the Pendle, which is also a land where where goblins and fairies and trolls were real to these people. You know, they live. This is before the Industrial Revolution now, so I think. You'll add a great, uh, what's the word, punch to the overall thrust. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a fantastic, it's in a beautiful big venue this year too as well. So it's going to be really, really, really cool to have you there. Can I, can I just go back to the Pendle Witches? Because it is something that fascinates me. I mean, I haven't got any in-depth, great in-depth knowledge of it. But you were saying about, um, I didn't know that about the, the witch uh, trials in um, in Ireland being, because in my mind, I, I just would have lumped it all together with uh, things that went across the UK. But do you think through uh, looking at that, do you think part of that was because of, um, I mean, I've always found uh, the Irish to have a, a, a deep respect slash fear of, of the fae and, and of that kind of world. And obviously there's that connection between witchcraft and, and familiars from, from that realm. Do you think that that might have played into it, that if you, uh, if you tried these witches, then you were taking on a bigger force even after they died? I, I don't know, to be honest with you, but I do know that in Catholic countries, witches were safe, more or less. With persecution of witches was very rare. I'm talking about Ireland, Portugal, southern France, Spain, it, 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 Italy. It didn't really happen. And, and and a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's it's quite interesting. It's a bit more complicated than that, that the Catholic Church had no problem with folk traditions. So they had no... Well, look, their whole religion is borrowed from paganism anyway. So they, they actually saw they had no problem with going to fairy wells. And they saw, they saw it as just a folk thing. It was harmless. But after Martin Luther and particularly Calvinism, and then King James. And even, it took a while for that to happen. The first English witchcraft law was by Henry VIII, and it wasn't really enforced. And if you were arrested, the chances of you actually being found guilty were quite low. You were, they nearly always got off, uh, because it was judged as a religious matter. So therefore, you had religious, religiously inclined judges and stuff like that. However, when King James came on the scene, and he wrote, you know, and he he wrote that he he wrote his uh, his demonology, it became he he glued it to statutory things. So you had in English law, you you had you had laws against witches in England that did apply to some parts of Ireland, 
because parts of Ireland, the pale around Dublin was belonged to England at the time. So they glued the legal framework to it. And that's when the slaughter began. Because then it, gave, it, was, it was ambitious civil servants could make a name for themselves in London by saying, I busted a whole bunch of witches. Mm. And they're also Catholics, double whammy. So there was a lot of that. The reason why it didn't happen in Ireland, I think, like, uh, there's, it, it, it was just, it was because we were Catholic. It's just that, and the Catholic Church saw it as a harmless, saw folk traditions as a harmless peasant thing, and didn't see any conflict with that. Uh, once they came to church and did all that stuff, they didn't care. So it, was, it purely was just a sort of a, a an administration and not a cultural difference between the two religions. Mm. Fascinating yeah. stuff, absolutely fascinating. And you're right that that area, uh, going back to the fairies, has it, it is just so rich, isn't it? Uh, such a rich uh, seam of, of of folklore within this country that um, even down sort of the Peak District way, definitely. And going back to that, if if uh, if you don't mind, um, we started off this conversation talking about uh, UFOs and and that kind of uh, re uh, relationship. Um, between ufology and uh fairy folklore um there is those connections from your point of view what 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 are those uh, connections could you explain to to the viewers well I, I, when i was like 11 or 12 i went through that mad ufo stage you know uh there was a newspaper here in our the tabloid it's still going called the sunday world and it was like a news of the world type irish version of that and it had like three or four pages when i was about 10 on Betty and what was her name? Betty and the other Barney, kids. Barney, Barney, Betty and Barney, and all the UFOs and Varick von Daniken. And, and I went nuts. I was like, it was just, you know, when you're a kid and these things hit you and they like get you like that, you know, and you're like, you're obsessed. So there I was, like sitting in my bedroom window, looking at every little logbook, you know, <laughs> wait for the UFO. <laughs> but nothing ever happened. But I read everything. And I mean, I was reading it for years and years. And I always had a fascination of, and I said, well, it's probably aliens, but it's probably most likely in many cases the U.S. the U.S. military messing about with secret technology. And then one day I was walking down Fifth Avenue when I was living in New York, I was kind of like my 20s. And there I see a, a gigantic poster in Britano's bookshop on Fifth Avenue of Whitley Strieber's communion of that alien, a massive poster. And I said, oh, I'll have a bit of that. And I went right in and bought the hardback, took it home, reading on the subway. And he was all, all, he immediately went into the fairy part of it. Mm -hmm. And I says, now we have something, you know, I'm really digging this. And he talked about his own heritage of being Irish and stuff. And he wondered if that had been part of it or something, a genetic thing and this kind of stuff and where it happened up in upstate New York in the woods. And then I discovered Jacques Villet and the Messages of Deception and Passport to Magnolia. They were, they were game changers for me. Mm -hmm. So was like the Mothman Prophecy. And also our haunted planet with John Keel calling, you know, UFO people crazy cultists and say they, they aren't they aren't aliens, there's something there's something else. And that was it. I was down on that. But I think it was Rosemary Ellen Guiley's book, The Vengeful Gin, did a lot for me. And you know, I was trying to this is a weird story. I her friend, Susan Shepherd. Was part was running the Mothman Festival. One of the runners of the uh, operators of Mothman Festival in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. She wrote a book on Ulster Scots folklore called "The Cry of the Banshee" and talked about the Banshee living in the Ohio Valley in West Virginia. So, I mean, the two of us became quite good friends online, and I was supposed to meet both of them, and both of them died suddenly out of the blue. And the last thing she did for me was get me a signed copy of Rosemary Allen Gardy's book, The Vengeful Jill. And it turned out that Rosemary Allen Gardy had seen my stuff and said, oh, I'd like to meet that man too. So it was like, here I was really excited. And then two women sadly die uh, unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. But Rosemary Allen Gardy was one of those people who was getting booed off the stage at UFO conferences. <clears throat> she was, that woman was a, a giant, an absolute. And, and it's weird. She used to have so many videos on YouTube and it's, they're really hard to find now. It's like the woman's being erased, but she was the one who said they're the jinn, and they're also in the in the, in Europe. They're connected to the fairies. They're they're these same energy forces are, are are able to do these things with lights, and 
she talked about plasma and that's what the smokeless fire at the gym well that's plasma right mm -hmm. but then there was other things too like there was a a, a, a megalith near here called creevy keel it's just in the north the road between sligo and donegal and it's quite a famous megalith before when ha that was known for years as lights coming out of it strange lights coming out of it as well as the locals wouldn't go anywhere near it because of fairies and they the, a team from Harvard excavated the, 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 the mound as it was back then in the late 40s. And the locals said the lights never came back and the fairies vanished. Mm -hmm. And so that made me think of something here. It's also you, Neil, when you spoke about when you were meditating in West Kennet Long Barrel. Because I have a West Kennet Long Barrel story too. Mm -hmm. About seven or eight years ago, I was in there with a guy called James Swaggart, who, was who had Capricorn Radio. We were making a film on megaliths. And if sadly they never came to pass, we ran out of money. But we were in West Kennet. The minute I walked into West Kennet Long Barrel, I was going, uh-oh, what's this? This is a new thing. So this is a new experience. This is very, very different, not only from the megaliths in Ireland, but also the megaliths in England and everywhere else. So I walked in, and, and, and he was filming me talking in one of the you know, two antechambers when you go in. Yeah. You go in, you go around the corner, there's two antechambers on either side. I was in the one, if you're walking towards the back of the, the, the 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 passage i was in the one on the right hand side if you're going in right a left if you're coming out and i had a guitar tuner on me that created a tone okay and we captured on camera and i'm so sorry this is lost and i said i said you you hear do you think a sound is weirdness with this chamber and he goes yeah it's this weird kind of like when you say something you hear behind like 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 as if you have like something wrong to your hearing or your eardrum's broken we were both hearing it just for a laugh i switched on the guitar tuner with, on it which is on an on an a which is 440 hertz Ooh, right what's going that thing it was going nuts it was like something of like a ufo film as soon as i put it outside the empty chamber it stopped put it back in went nuts now yeah. it was picking up it was just some kind of frequencies wrecking that thing and driving it nuts. And so I wasn't surprised when I heard your story about what happened to you there. And that's what I think. It's, 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 you see, it's, I hate to sort of think, I, ha I have to always watch myself when it comes to megaliths because there's a lot of Wiccans and New Agers are attracted to them for this stuff, but they're not always like that, as you know yourself. But there's, uh, there seems to be, in certain ones, uh, there was one in Sardinia that nearly killed me, actually, and West Kennet, that they're actually doorways into other dimensions, both for them and for us. And the ancients knew by arranging stones in certain ways, we know that by the roll white stones and the scientific tests done there, that you, they tuned them like you tune a radio. A, they pulled the air, antenna or the aerial out of a radio in the old days, that they knew that they, they arsed around with the stones in a certain spot that it actually, I, I'm convinced of that. So I, I think that, and, and, and again, West Canada is, is strange, is, is known for strange lights as well. So I think that's what we're dealing with. Into the, the, whatever the consciousness or the, into the, the ultra terrestrials, I always love that word that John Gill mm -hmm. deals with. That's what it is. Both the fairy folk and both the legitimate uh, UFO stuff. And when I, I say, that, that, sorry, sorry that, on, when I say legitimate UFO stuff, I'm talking about the ones that w looks like a spaceship and you zoom in on it and the picture goes fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And people yeah. always make that joke. How come there's no clear pictures? Because it isn't actually there as a material object. Yeah. It's just like a fairy. It's a disturbance in the field. Definitely. That's, that's absolutely perfect. It's a, I'm so glad you've, you've read my mind and Kate's mind probably because this was where I really want to just um, um, flesh this out a little bit in terms of those megalithic always prehistoric monuments usually neolithic sometimes sometimes bronze age um and just you know i've shown people this before this is a great influence on me this book uh folklore of prehistoric sites in in britain by the the archaeologist leslie uh grenzel long out of print and quite expensive to get now but it's basically just a gazetteer of folklore attached to prehistoric monuments and much of that folklore is fairy folklore mm -hmm. and of course if you wrote that 
if there was to be a new edition of that book now, I mean, he's he's talking about like 200 fairy related sites in Britain. And if you did that in Britain now and even extend it to Ireland, there'd be probably tens of thousands that, yeah. that, that, you, that, that you could put together. But what, what just going back to what you were saying about those um, our ancient ancestors, especially the Neolithic um, peoples, who were perhaps plugging in to whatever energy you want to talk about it. I mean, I've doused these energies. This is another, um, you know, you put, oh, you got to put your tin foil hat on. Oh, earth energy, so that's just a load of baloney. No, it's not. I've doused them and I felt them. And um, even though I'm not particularly psychic in any way, um, I I know they are there. And lots of other people, such as yourself and many other researchers, it's there. It's just not, you can't, you, 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 you can't, um, codify it with materialistic science you have to use other techniques and dousing is 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 the obvious example and i felt especially in around that avebury west kennet um landscape so but but do you think so those neolithic people were they tuning in to something that was already there and enhancing it for whatever reasons or is there possibility that they actually created it in the first place? I, I go for the former. Um, but I go for the former too. I go yeah. for the former too. And I'll tell you why. You imagine you're, you're, you're a farmer, you know, growing barley or wheat or whatever in Neolithic times, right? In UK or Ireland, England or Scotland, or whatever. You live in a time of, you're out in the fields all the time. It's hard intensive labor. Uh, you're out in all weathers, right? You don't have electronic electronic pollution. You don't have radio waves. You don't have microwaves. You don't have nothing. You've got stuff coming from space and that's it. You were spending all this time in the countryside. You develop this awareness and this feeling that certain places feel different than others. And you might discover, like I've given a classic example of that is the Round Towers of Ireland. Absolutely, the farmers will tell you that the cows and the sheep want to graze on the horses by the towers. And so they, they that was enhanced, but that was enhanced in Ireland. The, the towers were used for that agricultural reason. So they knew there was something in the in the landscape, and they could feel it. They, we have to use dowsing rods. They probably were very attuned to it, and uh, naturally, and they could they'd watch animals too. They'd watch the why would you know it, back down there was no hedgerows, and they would ask themselves why does the why does the foxes always take a right hand turn at that point, and they they they'd, they'd and the deer goes another way. And they, 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 what? And even birds, why did they suddenly turn over that field, you know? And this kind of thing. And they would figure out after a while that, oh, there's something here. There's some, or oh, this, that, whatever this force is in their own sort of re- proto shamanic religion, it feels like this here. And then they probably had, had gl- gl- glacial erratics that were by accident on these sites. And they set these stones in a psychometric set, we're really doing something here. And there may even be lights. So then they started playing with stones and and, and then they, they started to realize things that if their animals were nearby it, they were healthier. They were like in Ireland, we have these things called cork cairns and they're very similar to the neuragics. They're almost identical, actually, to the neuragics in, uh, in Sardinia. And they're, they've got two horns like this. And then there's a long tapered thing at the back and they're called cork cairns or sometimes cow cairns because they look like the corn. But I think they used to bring animals in there or people and heal them or make them have better yield with milk and things like that. And I think they discovered that there was a power these things had, but they also brought forward these beings, these entities, and these probably became their proto-religious gods or whatever, Mm. the beginning of it, and something like that. So my, I'd be with you, Neil, that this stuff was already there, but in the same way they mastered the land and agriculture and irrigation, they mastered the energies of the land mm-hmm. and the paranormal aspects of the land. I mean, I'm I'm playing around with electroculture at the minute, and, and it was just by chance, really, that I, that I um, that I noticed uh, just using copper, and um, I, I grow house plants, and I, I was gifted a. a a mushroom that was made out of copper that I just sticked in, stuck in one of my house plants. Now I had two identical uh, cuttings, and the one that had the copper mushroom in absolutely 
outshone, you know, tripled its size much quicker than the other. Um, so I do believe that, you know, if you harness uh, electromagnetism within uh, within the earth, that it does have that healing property on us. And we do feel it, you know, there are places and spaces that make us feel incredibly good and ones that overwhelm us and, and aren't so good. And talking about the role right, uh, for me, that that was a point in case I was told by a friend to take a, a compass uh, to go down to the is it the night stones down there? The, the, yeah, the, the night the, stones. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they were telling me the story that it doesn't happen to everybody who who takes a compass down there. But I took this compass. I had people stood round, absolutely fascinated. And the closer I got to the night stones, this compass was going berserk. I couldn't get it to stop from swinging this way and that way. It wasn't just going round in circles. It was very erratic. And other people tried and didn't get the same response. I mean, how would you explain that? That, you know, out of 10 people who tried it that day, there was perhaps two of us that that got the same response from, from, um, from that energy coming from them stones. And the proliferation of quartz in these sites, it's almost seen as a passing thing. Mm. Oh, well, this, these stones at the front are filled with quartz. Oh, let's oh, just as if it means nothing. Have you, have you covered, uh, do you know about Philip S. Callahan? Philip S. Callahan is this is this is someone you really you'll enjoy this. Philip S. Callahan was a U.S. military engineer who was based in Northern Ireland during the um, the Second World War, and he was an electronics whiz kid, like a genius. And he developed the communication system used between the ships and the troops on board that were used on D-Day for the Americans and the British. So when D-Day happened, he had nothing to do. So he was stuck in Northern Ireland with all this electronic equipment and nothing to do. He was actually the first American troop to cross over into the Republic of Ireland wearing an American uniform and not get arrested. That was one of his other things. He was a kind of a character. But he and his friends took an interest in the ancient sites of Ireland board. So they decided to do what we do, study megaliths and look at them. And they started using their equipment on them. And he became particularly fascinated by the the round towers, but not just them, all the megaliths. And he discovered that they had this thing called diamagnetic energy. And diamagnetic energy is caused by the crystalline structure of quartz uh, vibrating in such a way. You know, because quartz is used in radios and stuff like that. So it's, it has this, 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 this ability to generate this thing called diamagnetic energy. And he said, the me and he discovered that the, the, the megaliths were filled with this. And he wrote a book, he, were, he wrote a, a book of i think like a pamphlet called when he got back to america called the magnetic life of agriculture and then he went and visited it became you know like we all do obsessed with megaliths so he ended up going to tibet and he wrote another book which is called oh and i can't remember but you look it up uh nature's silent music i think it's called and it's mostly about the round towers in ireland and tibet and he was the that's a shame he should be a superstar uh, but he's quite he's fairly well known but he should be enormously famous his books are still in print but unfortunately in the 1970s 60s the hippies discovered the megaliths and they became obsessed with astrological alignments which is something i don't buy you know you could stand in the middle of somewhere like avebury and you could find some stone that points to anything on any date so the, the hippies love that and you had so the hippies took over the whole, and so so his work was forgotten, Philip S. Callahan. But he quite he absolutely showed that these things were built, tuned, adjusted, and used to create en energetic forces. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. No, I I haven't come across him, Thomas. So I, I should should know that. I'm so, slightly ashamed to, to it, say that. Only but... known, he's only known in Ireland and America. He has. It's this is the sad thing, you know. He hasn't really. Been, he hasn't been given as fair dues, you know. Yeah, but um, so, so, so now this, this is so staying sort of on that subject, but <laughs> expanding it into a subject which will be way too much for us to talk in the time we have uh, left. But if um, so, let's presume that our Neolithic Neolithic ancestors were plugging into those earth energies, building their monuments, and perhaps um. Uh, seeing and interacting with non-human intelligent entities of whatever sort which they may have seen probably as some kind of gods 
Um, and then that has become over the time through the folklore, through the historic period right up to now, they those historic those gods have perhaps diminutivized into fairies or, or, or fairy type ed, ed, entities. Um, let's just take that as a given. In which case, what do you think those non-human intelligent entities really are? Do they live in a standalone reality? Are they part of our collective consciousness uh, that's codified to certain, you know, time periods? I know that's a stupendously big question, but just, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? You know, what are they? I think we have to jump into the world of magic and demonology here now. Uh, you, you look at the cunning folk of England, they used to capture, a, 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 basically using demons, they would capture them using sigils and things like this. And the most common was one called Oberon, who was considered the king of the fairies. Now, why? Because he could travel in space time. And so if you actually put, if you look at the actual, if you look at the Goetia, you start realizing after a while that these are all semantic gods or semantic fairies that were demonized literally by the Abrahamic religions. You know, Pyman was basically a, a kind of a fairy god who protected the camels trade. And there's the camels caravans across the desert and so on and things like that. And the, 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 we, okay, we have absolute certainties that we can pin on them, right? And we have it in the fairy folklore in Ireland as well. Fairies have been captured to find things there. Where's me gold? You know, that old nonsense of the leprechaun. That's because they can see and they can travel through space time and they can find things, bury treasure and things like that. So the first thing, they're not localized to this version of reality that we our nervous system is attuned to. They seem to have the ability, unlike us, except when we do things like psychedelics or whatever, or have an accident, to be able to move between their quantum envelope, or what they call it, the wave function, and ours. That they are not confined to human space time. So therefore they operate outside the clock speed of the human brain, which is a very interesting thing when you start looking into that. And so therefore they are a level of some kind of intelligence that has been culturally codified in certain ways. The demons, like as Crowley said, in, in the past we knew them as demons and pixies, in the future they'll know them as something else, aliens, as we was talking about. But um they 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 are they are they're, they're non local. They are they are, but they can move between. Now I had a friend, Jim Mean, he died recently, and I'll give you two quick stories to deal with this. Right, I had a friend called Jim Mean, and his, he was a he died recently, sadly, and he was a communist and he was an atheist, right? And he had he used to like he he, he loved my book, The Druid Code, but he said, uh, when you can't tell all the, 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 the I just like reading about the stones, but nothing else, you know, that kind of thing. But he wasn't rude about it. that's the kind of guy he was, right? Mr. Mr. Material, right? But he tells me, you know, you know, my father went to the fairyland twice. <laughs> and I said, What do you mean? Well, he's walking down, he used to have like a plot of land that he used to like grow potatoes and barley and down by Ben Bowman. And twice he found himself in the fairyland. And I said, what was the fairyland like? And he said, it was like our world, except it was a mess. And I said, okay, carefully remember what your dad told you, because I need to hear this right now. He said, it looks like this world, but it's a mess. In bits, he used the Irish expression, in bits. He says, the animals don't look well. Uh, the, uh, the, the farmsteads and the houses and the fields are very badly tended. There's a sense, he said, it felt dirty and unhygienic. Whitley Stryber and others who have been abducted in, by the visitors have said that the experience felt unhygienic. They were they were been having these anal probes and all this. And it was, the inside of the spaceships were filthy. The spaceships were filthy. And I said, oh, that's a good one. So I said, well, your, your dad, does your dad believe in the fairies? And he goes, yeah, my dad believed in the fairies. And I said, well, do you? And he goes, oh, no, it's just some kind of mystery of the brain that, like, the neuroscientists haven't figured out yet, right? I used to paint with this other guy years ago. He was a retired detective sergeant here, uh, a guy called John O'Dullen. He, We had a, sit, a thing in the 80s in Ireland where we're at a Marian shrine, the statue of the Virgin Mary started moving. It was called the Moving Statues Phenomena. And it took place in a place called Ballon Spittal in County Cork, a beautiful place. And he went down out of curiosity. He was on holiday down there. And one Sunday when the Virgin was supposed to appear, he was standing there and thousands of people. And I said, so what happened? 
He says, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I went out the course. He mm. said, he says, the little fucking thing, fucking thing, fucking moved. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he was an atheist, the Mister. He was a, a detective, a forensic detective. So he was Mister, Mister, Mister Material Science as well. And I said, no. And I said, Thomas, it didn't. I said, well, like it's finger wagged or it gave you a wink at you, Mary Mary. And he goes, no, it's doing things like this. <laughs> and putting hands out, a statue. And he goes, yeah. And I said, I know, and it's a people, some people saw it and, and others didn't, but I saw it, he said. For about two seconds, it did that. And I said, well, what was that? I goes, it's a trick of the mind. It's mass, it's mass hallucination. Yeah. It's not like real. It's not real. But he said, if, if it gives these people comfort in their lives, it's harmless. But he goes, I got caught up in a mass hallucination. That's what he said. Now, I went down to Balance Spittle a few years ago. And the place is the most fairy laden glen you've ever been in your life with a statue of the Virgin Mary in the middle of it. And it's full of it's full of caves and cave systems. And that's gins, fairies, sorry. And that and, and before it was known for the Marian apparitions, it was known as the, a, a fairy glen. It was famous for fairies. Now, there's an interesting aside here. The bar that that landscape was raided constantly by Barbary pirates back in the 15 and 1600s. We used to like capture the entire population of the town to bring them off as white slaves. And the, basically Cornwall, happened in Cornwall too. And um, so you had these Muslim pirates in this area, Jin. And that was that for me, you know, because it's the same as Fatima. Fatima in Portugal had the Fatima and Marian shrine appearances. Had, had, it had it all. And that was in a place named after, I think, Muhammad's mother. And it was part of the Islamic Caliphate at one time. So it's all fairies. It's The fairy thing is real. And, they're, and they are, they like mess. That, where, are they, where are we allowed them to mess with us? But they like to, this is the thing with that. Have you and I ever noticed in all the years you've been dealing with this? And we see it with your friend. What's that that English gentleman who does those those lovely videos? Uh, oh, Edwin. Edwin Saunders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kate's favorite. I know, but why is it your favorite? I'll tell you why. Okay, and it's the same reason that the the legitimate fairy things and UFO things. There's a sense of theatricality. Mm. Have you noticed that? I bet you all the people you've interviewed have had, had those plausible stories. Whether they they always and they always there was a sense of theater, mm. as if these things like to perform for us, and. Uh, if it's not necessarily a trickster thing, but it's almost like they're it's a whether they're UFOs, whether they're aliens, whether they're fairies, whether they're the gin, there's an element of performance that they perform for us, that they give us a show. I uh, I, th I think that's absolutely right. I, I, I don't want to bring this back to me, but uh, yeah. as you as you know, Thomas, uh, I do have something called Charles Bonnet syndrome because of my eyesight. And I've had that for, for for years and years, and I have regular encounters with what I what I deem as as fairy type entities, which come into my visual range in in dark circumstances um, uh, on a, on a pretty regular basis. And exactly what you're saying, I I actually hadn't really framed it in this in in that way until you just said that about the theatricality of their performance they're they're often you know strutting around like a shakespearean actor yeah. um and and marching up and you know um saluting at you and behaving a bit a, a bit uh, ridiculously and that and and i've always, I've, I've never really i just thought oh well there they are this is what they like it's really interesting what do i think about that but it, there is there's that theatricality and you can go back through innumerable folklore stories exactly the same and, well, mo and, mod and modern stories. My right mother there, there. has my mother has the syndrome too. She got it when she got the Parkinson's. Yeah. When the Parkinson's got really bad. And she sees spacemen. That's what she calls them. I see spacemen standing around. That's what she sees. Really? And yeah. so that's, it, was, it was between yourself and your blog and her that made me realize this is not... Um, but even like the NHS says it's a very mysterious thing. That I think you're tuning into a different reality. I think you're actually, it's your way, it's, it's like a radar or a, a kind of like a sonar into that reality or something. Yeah, of, of course, the, you know, the easy materialist reductionist way out is to say it's an hallucination. Um, I, I can assure you, uh, and lots of other people with this syndrome say the same, 
it ain't a, an hallucination. No. It is there's a reality to it that is it's quite quite incredible. I've I've kind of come to take it um um a bit for granted to be honest. It's it's all about all right, here they come again. Uh, whereas actually <laughs> It's it's an amazing thing, and I, I like it. I, I like it. Well, but, it's, it's so, like so, once you get over the thing that you don't have a tumor or something, and you're not really very ill by it. Yeah, it's not mental illness. It yeah. suddenly takes on a new dynamic. Well, now I can study it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I do. I do like the uh, the analogy of, of the playfulness of um, of fairies, and um, and it, yeah, you're absolutely right with that. And but it's just come to mind of. You know, we we um we don't really understand the values and the morality uh, of that realm at all because they seem to um uh, act and react in a way that's not really in conjunction with our own moral values and standards. But it's it's almost as though those theatrics are 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 very childlike and very innocent. And it's all you know, it, it's the tarot card, the fool, isn't it? It's that kind of skipping along. They have this sense of just skipping along and just going with the flow of things. And there doesn't seem to be, a, you know, an obsession with a greater plan or who they are or what they're about. They just are, aren't they? They just, um, you know, like like kids are. They just are, and they're in the moment, you know. But we we transpose. Um, our, ourselves to try and understand them in the fact that we don't live in the moment as human beings that we don't just ride on these curiosities that are within us you know that we feel silly by being th theatrical and less given a stage and and maybe that's what it is maybe they they are just existing in that space doing those things I totally agree with that and I think that's I think if you look at the history of fairy fairyology, whatever you want to call it, fairy folklore, even like back with what's his name who wrote uh, Sherlock Holmes and the whole Cotting Cottingland fairies. Conan was very, Doyle. He brought, yeah, Conan Doyle. There was, very <laughs> little, there was very little attempt to understand what the phenomena was. Yeah. It was almost like, uh, isn't it fun? Isn't it, isn't it enchanting? Now, there's another one I want to bring up. And this might play into the theatrical thing. I never thought about this until now. In England, does it what you call the Fae have a much more benign reputation than the she have in Ireland? Where my grandmother, who was a woman who ran a, you had a, you know, she was an educated woman and ran a chain of children's clothes stores in the Midlands, but she grew up in the bogs, you know. She absolutely believed 100% in the fairies and she was terrified of them. Her family were terrified. You people around here. The old folks are terrified of them. Now, uh, why, I, why, you know, they they will go to extraordinary lengths to avoid them. In now, it's it. There's the whole thing now that they all left because of electricity. There's a lot of truth to that, by the way. This the famous the all the, the silent the, I think it's a silent glen in uh, in County Down. The fairies all left. There was no one for fairies. The fairies left after they built a power station. And they were never seen. So they seem to be affected by electricity. So we're into the electromagnetic thing again. Mm -hmm. But they went. So maybe the fairies being nasty in Ireland is them living up to their reputation. Mm -hmm. where, and, in, and in England, where they're seen as kind of like enchanting and fun and playful, they live up to that reputation. Mm -hmm. They're putting on a performance. I think I think that that's that's true on one level. But I think um when uh when people because these are such um short encounters that people have when you read especially modern encounters with with the fae not being taken to fairyland but actually seeing them um because they're so brief like two to three seconds of, of an encounter is 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 a standard isn't it it's it's not um you know it's not a long length of time that, that generally people uh, regard seeing them so they don't fear them but there's also the other aspect where the fairies have been attributed to say things like poltergeist activity or haunting activity, we, we've separated that completely. So in the past, in, 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 in Britain and over Europe, if you had poltergeist activity, um, it would have been attributed to a house brownie or you'd piss the fairies off, you know, and these things were happening. And it's, it's culturally grown into that's something else. You know that yeah. that's a noisy spirit, or that's an angry, angry human spirit that's that's causing those things. I tend not to think of it in those terms. So maybe it's not 
that they are these whimsical things in the UK. It's just that we've stopped associating the things of their behaviours because we don't see them so often. And I do think that there is much need for people to be respectful, if not fearful, of these things. You know, we, 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 we have lost that in this country and it's to our detriment, I think. I think spiritual wildlife is a good way to kind of think of it. Yeah. They're, they're like a spiritual wildlife that needs protecting in the same way the deer, the badgers and everything else does. <laughs> and uh, I think then thing that's that's the way to kind of approach it. But I want to bring back the poltergeist. Have you known that the poltergeist is generally an urban experience? I yeah. don't know too many country houses that have poltergeists. But I oh, know. I d- yeah, I do. I, I've, I've, oh, yeah. Yeah, over I... here, it's always in towns and cities from, <laughs> all, from all I know. Yeah. It's, it's always in a, it's always a terrace a street of terrace houses it's never it's never an isolated cottage in the bog you know that kind of thing yeah i i think that those are probably the most reported on and the, the most famous cases um and often they are associated aren't they with obviously with teenage girls and deprivation and all kinds of uh traumatic issues that come no up. No father at home. Yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. But they are the they are the famous cases. The le- the less famous cases I actually find uh, much more interesting. Um I, I know that from one of the interviews that we've recently done, I've I've rekindled my um passion for Jeff the Mongoose, which is part poltergeist um and, and that took place in a very rural setting on the isle of man i could see neil shaking his head there but i'm going to get you onto this jeff the mongoose oh, thing I, I, neil. Got, i'm going to the isle of man soon where was this are you there? yes i'm going to do see some of the megaliths there so where i'm there's some of the rune stone stuff now isle of man is interesting because the northern half of the island is norse and the southern half of the island is gaelic so yeah. you literally have in the middle of the island the, the elves meet the leprechauns, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 the trolls meet the she. Yeah. So I, I find that fat, and there's even like the stones in the island that are like half rune stones, half ohms script on them. So I've been always, I've been there as a teenage boy at a Boy Scout thing, but I've never been there as a proper investigator. But where, but that's where was this in in the island? So it's um, looking up. It's on the uh, the west side, in the mid, right smack bang in the middle, on the on the west coast, just off the west coast. I know that from the farm, the farmhouse doesn't exist there. I think it was Saxon. The, there were Saxon remains uh, found there. It's um, it's. I think it's near the the famous Fairy Bridge. Bizarrely enough, Thomas, I'm going. I'm taking a trip up there uh, this year as well uh, to do some research because I I just. That particular case fascinates me. I'm not going. I'm not going to go on about it because uh, Neil's not convinced about this one. But there is connections with that story, with it being fairy as well. You know, shape shifting uh, fairy um, podcast activity. It just it, it piques my interest massively. Where where did we go with this before I start chuntering on about Jeff the mongoose? Where 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 did we leave off? I've, I've... Well, how how culturally different the we at least spoke yes. in our first interview. That the, the she are in, considered in Ireland compared to the Fae in, in England. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a true anomaly. It's a true, uh, you know, mystery. And I, I, I'm deeply fascinated by it. It's the, the only thing that I can come up with, and this isn't. Uh, this isn't a complete answer, but there, I, I'm thinking. You know, think think about um, W. Y. Evans Vence's book when he travelled around all of the Celtic countries, yeah. uh, obviously including Ireland, and in Ireland and Brittany, there is very distinctive correlation between the fairies and the dead. That wasn't as marked in the other in Scotland and Wales and and Cornwall, and and the Isle of Man. So that that might have something to do with it. That kind of fear of both the dead, and the dead being one and the same as the fairies, maybe more in Ireland and Brittany than in in those other Celtic countries, and obviously perhaps and in England. That's the only thing that I that comes off the top of my head that could explain that. See, see, England is different than all these islands because you had the, you had two traumatic events: the Dane laws when the Danish Vikings were here, and the harrying of the North under the, the Normans. So that's why enormous amount, amounts of English folklore were lost when the Normans arrived, unfortunately. And so you know we don't so much was lost, but they basically was genocide, really. Mm-hmm. Of the, the rural folk, and then you have the the other. I was compounded later on by the industrial revolution, where people moved from the countryside into Manchester and Birmingham and Sheffield and all these places. An awful lot was lost then. 
Yeah. And so it, it's it's almost like England is trying to rediscover it. And I find that especially I often wonder if like that was even what started with Cottingley was that England is trying to rediscover that heritage that was like lost between the, the Normans, the Dane law and the industrial revolution. Yeah, I, th I think that's that, that's definitely, and, and I would I see what you're saying about the the, the you know the scouring of the north and uh, that loss of people who would have kept that folklore. But I think the industrial revolution and that mass movement from the countryside in the towns is the biggest thing. The the and you know that uh, that obviously that was happening in the 19th century through to the 20th century. But I, I think the First World War was the real marking point. And that's why that book by W.Y. Evans Vence, I think, is so important, because he captured the time right at the end of that rural way of living that was uh, just completely destroyed by the First World War. Everything was different afterwards. So we're, we're lucky to have that. that, that and, and, and the 19th century folklorists, we're lucky to have those. Uh, that folklore captured at that very special moment in time. But I think the industrialization and the movement from rural areas to the towns is the biggest thing. That, that, and you know, the fairies did that folklore. too. In that book, <clears throat> in that book, and also in William Butler Yeats' uh, book on Irish uh, folklore, and Lady, not Lady Wilde, the other one, Lady Gregory. Gregory, yeah. There was a group of fairies that lived in the mountain up here called the Gentry. And they were indistinguishable from humans, except they were taller, but they otherwise they looked like humans. So they were probably similar to the Elvish kind of idea in the Scandinavian country. Around the 1880s, they took, they left the, met the countryside and took an interest in urban living. And according to the folklore around here, they moved to Dublin, they moved to Vienna, they moved to Budapest, mm -hmm. and they joined cafe society. <laughs> and the Bohemian Society and became artists. And it's just so funny that that ties in with things like the Impressionist movement, Monet, uh, like lots of things in England, the literary thing and stuff like that. So, you know, it's almost like, you know, it's like just an amazing thing when I heard that, you know, that they'd moved and become that they've become cafe society. Yeah. But they were still fairies called the gentry, and they were distinguishable yeah. by that they were taller, and they tended to be very elegant and refined and very courtly. Fascinating, uh, fantastic story. Fantastic. I think on that point, um, we we could actually we could make a, a whole another um, talk about about this as a as a leaping off point. I think it's absolutely. Uh, ho hold on, before you wrap it up, Kate. I'm, I'm holding on. I can hold on all night. <laughs> I, don't, I know we're over time and everything, but we did discuss before we came on about the rumble. I, oh, I, yes, I, the I rumble. just wanted Thomas's story about the rumble. I was telling Thomas that today I've been feeling very odd today. It's been a very odd atmosphere that is, is just I, I cannot quite work it out. And I live in Wallasey, which is over the river from Liverpool. And most days I walk along the promenade uh, overlooking the River Mersey. It's a very pleasant walk and go to a park. And I've lived here five years. And today there was this incredible rumble in the air. And it wasn't the docks on the other side. It wasn't the clanking of the recycling plant over the river. It, it, there was a rumble and it was seemed to be around me. It seemed to be because I was looking at other people on the promenade thinking, are you hearing this? Maybe you are. Maybe, I, I don't know. How could I know if, unless I asked them? And this lasted for over half an hour, all the way, walked to the park, coming back. And then finally, it just went away. And it was very mysterious and it matched my mood. So is that coming out? You know, I don't know whether that's coming out of my consciousness or whether it's coming from an external source but you said Thomas that you had a similar experience to that and I'd like just to end off by hearing about it. 15 years ago in the backyard I was doing some astronomy I had a really powerful set of military binoculars on a, on a tripod and I used to just love like the stars and stuff like that just a hobby nothing serious and there was this rumbling incredible feeling I could feel it in the ground I could hear it in the air and I thought it was coming from my neighbor's Jimmy. He's an old cow shed there, but he keeps his tractors and he has a generator in it and a few other like, farming tools. He doesn't do it. He doesn't use, really use it. But sitting there, and I went over to it, and I went up to the wall of the cow shed and touched it, and I could feel it in the wall. But I could feel it in the ground further in the, in, at the wall on the other side of my property. And it seemed to be coming from above, from space, right? 
So I went down, he lives about 50 yards down the road, and I says, Jimmy, I think there's something wrong with your barn. Your generator's going to go, make sure you check there's something wrong with your generators and go on fire. And he goes, no, Thomas, the power's completely switched off. There's no power can get in there. I put the, 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 the mains are pulled off from it. And he says, well, he says, he, he says, do you hear? And he goes, yeah, I do hear it. And he heard it. And I says, what do you think it is? And he goes, the guy called John, who lives built a bit further down, has a state-of-the-art milking shed where he does milking. He has a beautiful dairy herd and he used to he machine, automatic milking machines. He said, it's probably that. And I says, I don't know. It's not coming from there. It's coming from the sky. And he goes, it has to be from that. So the next day I went over and said to him, did you have your machines running last night about 10 o'clock? And he says, no, no, the cows are all, I sold them off. Like they're, they're waiting for the new herd. And he goes, and the milking machine was definitely off. And he goes, why? And it's a herd of rumbling. He goes, like, did it sound like a home, an electrical home come from the sky? Yes, and I it says, yeah. like, like uh, a transformer. And I says, that's exactly what it sounds like. And he says, yeah, I heard that too. Crazy. Um, there is lots and lots of lots of videos on YouTube from all around, all around the world, where people have not only experienced it for, uh, you know, a few minutes or, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour. People have, have been experiencing it for days on end um and it, they they liken it to um i think it was something like a, a god trumpet it was something yeah. along those lines that it was the reverberation was coming from the sky but hitting the earth and, and, and giving uh, a vibration to the earth oh, at the same time neil, neil yeah. tell you it wasn't pleasant i can tell you that mm. i didn't find the i didn't find that that rumble pleasant it made me feel all of off of sorts yeah, so, so, same here. It was, uh, it was, it was, yeah. in, it was in that strange mood anyway, and it was, it, there was an ominous feel about it. And yeah. exactly as I say, it, it is coming from above. I, I, was, I was, I was just too shy to sort of grab hold of someone and say, you know, "Can yeah. you hear this?" So I'm just two fellows. To... I spoke to both heard at the same time, so it wasn't just me. I tell you what, I, I've got it. I've got the answer, guys. It's the aliens. Coming back round, it's it's the aliens yeah, it from America. Be. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a brilliant circular um way to end up that the the, the podcast, Kate. Well done, <laughs> Thomas. Can I ask before we go, um, what are your plans for the future? What have you got going off this year? Um, can you give people links where they can find you? You you know what what what's what with that? Well, my main channel now is Beyond Room Three One Three, behind me, and that's where I cover a lot of the topics we've spoken about tonight. And I have a weekly show there with Sarah Mondaini, which is called the uh, the Hocus Focus, and we basically are doing our own take on paranormal stuff, and it's I've been enjoying that very much. I've also done documentaries and films there. I've written a book, co-written a book. Uh, well, I've written loads of books, but the latest one is on the Pendle Witches. Look out for that. Coming from the viewpoint that magic is real, that's what distinguishes, and not not in a Wiccan way, and uh, quite a lot of folklore in that as well. So it'll be a good. If you're interested in North of England folklore, there's a fair bit in that book as well with Neil. And then basically I'm planning some trips and I want to get, I, I've been I've been slacking on the filming lately. So I want to make a few films on a few other things. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's all good. I can't, I'm keeping busy and I can't complain. And uh, I'm really kind of looking forward to see how things develop with this all weird stuff that's going down in America. Uh, it's like, I've learned since 2020 that we're living in a bad Doctor Who episode. So rather than being bewildered by it, I'm going to sit back and try and enjoy it. Good for you. Good for ab you. Ab absolutely. And I, can, can I just say that Ho Hocus Focus, I think you've done six episodes now, haven't you? Um, it really is good. You've re you're really pinning it down. It's beautifully edited. It looks great. And the stories are just, you know, every story is like, it is go into quite a bit of depth in, in them you know you give it an hour and a half don't you each, each show and it, it allows you just to sort of allow those stories to breathe and go into them in a bit of depth brilliant and we have li live uh, five minute location report films and i'm inviting either one of you guys or both you guys if you want to make a five minute film on anything 40 and we you know, to promote this channel send it to me brilliant yeah thank okay, you yeah. I, I don't have a smartphone, so uh, th that one's going to be down to you. <laughs> You're leaving technology with me, Neil, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. Anyway, I want to thank you, uh, Thomas, for coming along again. Um, I know you're really, really busy, so um, pinning you down has been an absolute pleasure. Um, as always, raft of knowledge out of that. My brain's buzzing. I don't know about yours, Neil, but um, 
always great to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming along, Thomas. Yeah, same here. And before we meet up in England, let's do this again. Definitely, definitely, yeah. definitely. And I'll see us anyway in uh, is it October, September, October. Se se no, 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 se September. 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 Beginning of September. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, guys. And uh, this is a blast. I really enjoyed myself. Fabulous. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, guys.